It is a pleasure, of course, uh, to return to uh, Bar Ilan University, and, and particularly, uh, I'm pleased to join uh, the program of the Besa Center. Uh, the American Embassy and Besa uh, have cooperated on numerous fronts uh, over many years. Uh, Besa continues uh, to distinguish itself under your uh, leadership, Professor Imbar, uh, for the excellence uh, and quality of its research projects. It's also, and this is why we in the policy world appreciate it, it's an institution deeply rooted in the practice of international affairs. Abstractions are not what you deal in. Policy relevance is the coin of the realm, uh, and that's why Besa plays such an important role in the national security uh, community. Uh, you've uh, all dis also distinguished yourselves by putting peacemaking uh, high on the agenda, which is symbolized, of course, by the two leaders, Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, uh, for whom this institute is named. Uh, and as always, Professor Barr, thanks for your hospitality uh, and for welcoming me here. Uh, the embassy supported your 20th anniversary program last year, uh, and we look forward to continued engagement and partnership. Uh, I want to acknowledge and welcome uh, my American colleagues, uh, some of whom traveled a long distance to attend the conference, including uh, Steve Simon, my former colleague at the National Security Council. Uh, many members of our American Embassy staff are here as well. Uh, and also thank the Israeli participants, uh, including uh, some of whom I've been deeply privileged to work closely with uh, in recent years, uh, particularly General uh, Yaakov Amidror and Uzi Arad. Uh, a number of other international guests are here as well, and, and I want to welcome them as well. Now, given that we're in the age of Twitter, uh, and that, of course, is an absolute uh, requirement of ambassadors these days to be uh, quick, quick with the Twitter, quick with the tweet. Uh, I was contemplating a speech of less than 140 characters <laughs> that would sum up the mood of this, uh, this uh, conference. Uh, and in fact, in light of some of the angst that I know has been expressed about America's uh, leadership, uh, I was thinking about just standing up uh, and showing off uh, one of those t-shirts, my favorite t-shirt from the tourist markets in Jerusalem. You know the one with the F-16 on it? And it says, don't worry, America, Israel is behind you. <laughs> Come to think of it, we might have an F-35 on that, uh, that T-shirt soon, which says, it says something in and of itself. Uh, but the truth is, uh, without a doubt, we are in an exceedingly complex international strategic picture today. And it's precisely at times like these that American leadership is so vital. And it's precisely because it's so vital that President Obama is providing that leadership. What I'd like to do uh, during my talk uh, and leaving time for questions is reflect on uh, American leadership and its relevance to Israel specifically, uh, then highlight several examples where American leadership is making the difference, uh, including uh, in the Middle East, uh, and conclude with a few short uh, comments uh, about uh, looking out at the period ahead. And I'll draw on some of the recent uh, statements by uh, Vice President Biden and uh, Secretary Kerry at the Saban Forum in Washington, which I attended this weekend. Uh, now, it's no mystery why Israelis take such a keen interest in evaluating American leadership. Uh, Israel's national security concept itself centers on the twin necessities of self-reliance uh, and the cultivation of alliances, uh, in particular great power alliances. Uh, Israel's founders were sober about the threats, both near and far, that the Jewish state faced. And these threats necessitated the establishment of a strong military that could both outgun and outsmart its rivals. Uh, and all too often, Israel found that it had to wage war. Uh, but even when it fought alone, uh, such as it did in June 1967, or even as recently as this summer, it has never sought to stand alone in the world. Now, whether waging war, standing guard and deterrence, or negotiating peace, Israel's position has been immeasurably enhanced through its partnerships and alliances, and supreme among those has been the extraordinary alliance uh, that Israel has with the United States. In America's more difficult moments on the world stage, just think uh, perhaps of our exit from Vietnam in 1973, the ripple effects are felt here. Uh, on the other hand, when our power and influence surge, such as after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the rising tide benefits our allies, such as Israel. Uh, as General Amidror and others have noted time and again, and he did today, Israel rightly prioritizes its own interests, as any country would and should, but it also must consider its stake in America's global position. For Israel, America's global standing is quickly translated into the local context. When America was attacked on September 11, 2001, Israelis stood by us, as only our closest allies could be expected to. Yet at that time, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon worried that the new strategic imperatives would present America with trade-offs, 
uh, that would increase pressure on Israel to make concessions uh, that ran contrary to its interests. I don't think that's how it turned out, but that anxiety about being subject to great power concerns and linkage politics is certainly understandable, and perhaps it's inevitable given uh, Israel's position and its, and its relationships. But with so many imminent threats, both on its borders and over the horizons, Israelis obviously feel the need to focus on immediate, immediate challenges. Life living on a razor's edge sometimes makes it hard to focus on that broader strategic reflection. And yet, time and again, and sometimes in the very heat of battle, Israeli leaders do take America's broader position into account, because America's standing is itself a high order, almost existential is interest of Israel. Uh, Israel's founders, from Ben-Gurion and Eshkol to Shamir and Rabin, were keen observers of America's position on the world stage. Whether a distant conflict like the Korean War in the 1950s or one much closer to home like the first Gulf War 40 years later, leaders here calculated Israel's strategic equation through the prism of America's standing. Now before surveying several specific cases, I want to lay out the administration's overall framework for global engagement. In his address to uh, the cadets of West Point uh, in May of this year, President Obama unambiguously confirmed, uh, affirmed Mer America's commitment to global leadership. The imperative of American leadership is unquestioned. Now there are intense debates uh, in the United States over how to manage our global, our global role, uh, but that should not be confused with a lack of consensus about maintaining our unique role as a global power. That basic necessity of American leadership is widely unchallenged within American political society. Speaking before the United Nations General Assembly in September, President Obama made a powerful case that American leadership remains the one constant in an uncertain world. That indeed is what sets America apart. The world looks to America to lead, and America embraces that responsibility. Even as we consider judiciously each case of engagement or intervention, including how other like-minded states will or will not work with us in concert. For the United States, acting decisively and legitimately go hand in hand. In the West Point address, the President also reiterated his unwavering commitment to maintaining the United States' military primacy and to use force when necessary, sometimes even unilaterally. He also emphasized our response in such cases should be proportional and effective and just. But he also stressed the need to broaden our tools, to include diplomacy and development, sanctions and isolation, appeals to international law, and if just, necessary and effective, multilateral military action. Just because we have the best hammer, the President said, does not mean that every problem is a nail. In addition to the judicious use of American power and our emphasis on collective action, our vision of American leadership is also that we must lead by example. Altogether, this framework is consequentialist as it's at, its, at its core. As the President has said consistently since coming to office, this model of American leadership is more effective, more sustainable, and far less likely to lead to interventions gone awry. In terms of the instruments of American leadership, our framework also includes a renewed commitment to engage at the United Nations whether it's supporting peacekeeping in states torn asunder by conflict, inflicting sanctions on terrorist groups and states that violate international norms like Iran and North Korea, promoting human rights and human dignity, or responding to global health crises, we believe deepening our engagement at the United, Nation, at the United Nations has been a smart investment. Now on this point, Israelis are understandably skeptical because we all know that Israel does not get a fair shake at the United Nations. Yet even on issues of concern to Israel, we believe our investment at the UN is helping to counter the forces of delegitimization, generating new opportunities, and chipping away at old impediments to Israel's participation in the global system. Collective action and partnerships, as National Security Advisor Susan Rice has said, is also the cornerstone of our counterterrorism strategy, which is designed to meet a threat that is now more diffuse and decentralized. Whether it's defending the homeland or protecting allies, disrupting Al-Qaeda's networks, or ridding the world of Osama bin Laden, the administration's counterterrorism policy has demonstrated a sustained commitment, broadened and deepened partnerships, and racked up considerable successes. 
Our soft power is also formidable and is a critical element of this framework. Promoting democracy, championing human rights, supporting free markets, defending religious freedom, combating global anti-Semitism, safeguarding the rights of women and girls, responding to global health emergencies, or standing up for the rule of law. In all of these, American leadership is just as central to promoting norms uh, and improving human security as it is responding to traditional security threats. Now, as America's representative in Israel, I'm particularly proud that Israel joins us in so many of these efforts, whether it be promoting entrepreneurship as an engine for economic development, nurturing one of the world's most open societies, confronting the scourge of human trafficking, or defending the rights of gays and lesbians, Israel is our partner in promoting human rights and human security, even in the face of its own secure, extreme security dilemmas. So with this framework in mind, I'd like to lay out a few examples of where American leadership is making the difference today and in places where no other global player can substitute. Let me start by focusing on the campaign against ISIL, or Daesh. In Syria and Iraq, we are taking collective action to counter these violent extremists who destabilize governments, kill civilians, rape women, and behead hostages. We're doing so with legitimacy, and we're drawing on the broad range of tools that I just outlined to do so. The United States is currently leading a coalition, the likes of which has not been seen since the first Gulf War. It is made up of nations who share our objective to degrade and ultimately destroy Daesh. Numerous countries, as Secretary Kerry said, have come forward with critical commitments, and many others have expressed strong opposition to Daesh's campaign of terror and of horror. The world is uniting against this threat. But America, and America is not alone in this fight. In Brussels last week, Secretary Kerry chaired a ministerial meeting of this coalition with some 60 nations represented. Six months ago, this coalition did not even exist, and many scarcely recognized the threat of Daesh. U.S. leadership has brought it to the fore. Behind the scenes, our military is engaged in the painstaking work of transforming this political coalition into a battlefield alliance. Already, multiple Arab partners and NATO allies have taken part in the air campaign against Daesh. Since the summer, using airstrikes and support for the ground forces of our regional partners, we have been able to shrink the territory under Daesh's control and halt many of its advances. We're providing military advisors to the Iraqi security forces and the Kurdish Peshmerga, who have improved their battlefield performance. Through quiet, intensive diplomacy, we've also pushed for a more inclusive Iraqi government and for a solution to the crippling dispute over oil revenues so that Iraq can play a full, its full role in this effort. We're also increasing our support to vetted, moderate Syrian opposition units. So Syrians do not have to choose between a tyrant, Bashar al-Assad, and the terrorists of Daesh and, and al-Nusra, as, as Secretary Kerry said this weekend. We're drawing upon our existing counterterrorism capabilities to cut off funding and stem the flow of foreign fighters to Daesh, and we're leading the effort to track and prevent those fighters who return home from spreading terror elsewhere. In the public arena, we're exposing Daesh's hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of its absurd religious claims and its barbaric behavior that is antithetical to Islamic values. America is also leading the humanitarian response providing assistance to the millions of Syrian and Iraqi civilians who are in desperate need and bolstering frontline countries who have been overwhelmed by the flow of refugees. We're prepared for a long fight and we understand this, this is a complex battlefield. I also want to point out one critical threat that has not materialized during this campaign, a dog that didn't bark, if you will. The current fight against Daesh is taking place in a context in which the vast majority of Syria's chemical weapons and the infrastructure used to create one of the largest chemical weapons arsenals in the world was peacefully dismantled and destroyed over the past year. This achievement was the result of the credible threat of American force, which created a diplomatic opening to, to strike a deal with Russia, and the building of a strong international coalition to carry out the extraction and destruction of Syria's chemical weapons. Had we not secured this outcome, the fight against Daesh today could have been even more dangerous and deadly, including for Israel. Next, I'd like to address the Iranian nuclear negotiations, which have now been extended uh, to, into 2015. In this effort, 
the United States is similarly taking the lead in generating collective action. We are also garnering broad international support and drawing on a wide range of diplomatic tools to, in support of our objective. President Obama has stated the objective unequivocally, and he has also said it here in Israel in no uncertain terms. The United States will not allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon, period, period. And we will use all elements of our national power to achieve that objective. Now, for the United States, and I believe for Israel, the preferred route to achieve this objective has always been and remains a negotiated outcome. A diplomatic solution, as Vice President Biden said on Saturday, still represents the best and most sustainable path to prevent a nuclear-armed Iran. Now, at the same time, we have ensured that we have a credible military option as well. But Vice President Biden laid out the logic of the negotiations in his public remarks at the Saban Forum. First, we built the most crippling sanctions regime ever imposed against any nation. That brought Iran to the table. Then, with our P5 plus one partners, we reached the Joint Plan of Action interim agreement one year ago. That agreement ensured that we would not have to negotiate with a gun to our head by freezing key elements of the Iranian nuclear program, including its upper level enrichment and installation of advanced centrifuges, and rolling back other elements, like dismantling its stockpile of enriched uranium. The Joint Plan of Action provided very modest sanctions relief, but otherwise maintained the economic stranglehold on Iran. We have engaged other world powers and conducted vigorous enforcement actions, designating dozens of companies, which helped to explain how we've been able to hold the line on international sanctions over the past year. Did some interna did international companies and investors rush in last year, as skeptics suggested they might? No, there's been no gold rush to Iran. With our economic chokehold still in place, most smart investors continue to keep Iran at arm's length. And as oil prices drop, the pressures on Iran only intensify. Throughout these negotiations, we have had our disagreements with Israel on certain tactical questions. It's true. But these disagreements come within the broader context of our total alignment on the broader strategic imperative of preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon and our close and intimate U.S.-Israeli dialogue that runs in parallel to the P5 plus one process. In fact, I was in Washington in late October for the latest meeting of our U.S.-Israel uh, consultative group, which is our most senior level coordination mechanism on Iran and other regional issues. And I can tell you firsthand that uh, our dialogue on this question is second to none. Uh, it has kept us aligned and it has informed our negotiating strategy with the Iranians. And we're both in agreement on one other key principle. No deal is better than a bad deal. Now, the evidence for this is precisely the decision to extend negotiations last month. Iran simply was not prepared to make the necessary concessions to provide certainty that it would never acquire a nuclear weapon. So there was no deal. We believe a deal is still possible, and our international partners remain united, so an extension was the right decision. But there will only be a deal, and Iran can only achieve the sanctions relief it seeks if it shows more flexibility in the negotiations ahead. Outside this region, one of the gravest challenges we face has been the crisis over Ukraine. War and, armed, armed, war and armed conflict have returned to Europe. As a popular movement for freedom, good governance and democracy was confronted by outright military aggression and subtler forms of coercion, it was left to the United States to rally the world against Moscow's revanchism. Neither the new, new, new democracies of East and Central Europe nor the European Union were in a position to confront Russia without U.S. leadership. We did not flinch, and we have stood by our allies and partners. The United States has mobilized opposition to Putin's aggression, and we've bolstered Ukraine's independent, freely elected government, and we've deterred a broader conflict and have imposed stiff costs on Russia. At the United Nations, we rallied 100 nations to declare Russia's annexation of Crimea illegal. Within the NATO alliance, we've reinforced our commitments to frontline states and increased our military presence. When a civilian airliner was tragically shot down this summer, an act of murder on a grand scale, the United States reacted swiftly and built a coalition that ensured international access to the crash site and put the perpetrators on the defensive. For months, through often painstaking efforts, we've convinced dozens of states to follow our lead on economic sanctions, measures that have sent the Russian economy reeling. In this case, it is the U.S. leadership 
that ensured it would not be business as usual for Russia and that Russia would continue to pay a significant and I might add rising cost for its aggression. Perhaps few international challenges crystallize the unique demands on America's leadership position today more than the recent outbreak of the Ebola virus in three West African nations, a global public health challenge of the highest order. Thousands have died and potentially tens of thousands more could be infected. It's also decimating health providers, the very front line of any response to a massive outbreak. Given the limited capacity of the affected states to respond and the risk of the spread of the virus across borders, the crisis has cried out for an international collective response. Again, the United States is leading. We're pursuing collective action and drawing on a wide range of tools. We could easily hide behind two great oceans, but have instead chosen to act. Nearly 3,000 American service members are now in West Africa, augmenting what was a small force of several hundred sent just a few months ago. And we've committed hundreds of millions of dollars in new assistance and made sure that hundreds of health care providers and disaster response experts are trained and take up their positions on the ground. Beyond our own contributions, American leadership has pushed Europeans, the UN, and others to stretch their own capabilities, leading to a sum total, although still inadequate, that is catching up to the threat. Ebola has no greater friend than fear, said my colleague and friend, our representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Samantha Power, who was one of the first international figures to travel to West Africa and put a face on American leadership. We are leading by example to confront that fear and defeat this global threat. In East Asia, as economic and political change intensify, the United States is reinforcing American leadership in that vital region. Whether it's bolstering collective security commitments to allies like Korea and Japan, deepening our engagement with regional institutions like ASEAN, confronting North Korean provocations with a strong united international coalition, or engaging emerging powers like China in hard-nosed bargaining, America is leading. Generations of Americans have served and died in the Asia Pacific so that the people of that region might be, live free, President Obama said in Australia a few weeks ago. So no one should ever question our resolve or our commitment to our allies. China is a good example of where the administration has worked intensively to develop a new model of relations that would avoid the historic trap of strategic rivalry. We saw this on the display at the Sunnyland Summit between President Obama and President Xi, and then again during the President's trip to China last month. These efforts are bearing fruit in the agreements reached on reducing emissions that cause climate change and on cutting tariffs on information technology. We are also strengthening ties with other regional players like Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Burma, all of which want to deepen their connections with the United States. Now here in Israel, attention is understandably focused on challenges closer to home. Generations of, Israeli, of Israelis know of our enduring investment in Israel's security and the pursuit of peace between Israel and its neighbors. These remain sacred commitments affirmed by multiple presidents, supported by the United States Congress, and cherished by the American people. American leadership in support of Israel can be measured through the deep ties and joint training between our militaries, our unprecedented intelligence cooperation, which makes both of us safer, our fight to defend Israel from delegitimization in the international organizations, and our investment in life-saving, cutting-edge defense systems like Iron Dome and Arrow. It can also be measured through our leveraging of global relationships to generate broader support for a two-state solution, through the building of coalitions to confront terrorism on Israel's borders, and through America's ongoing economic and security assistance to Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority, which we have sustained for decades at unprecedented levels and which contribute greatly to regional stability. President Obama and his administration are constantly striving to identify new opportunities to nurture and sustain opportunities for peace and security. Israel experienced that during President Obama's historic visit to Israel last year. In his speech in Jerusalem, he made the simple but profound argument that peace is necessary, peace is just, and most importantly to those who might give in to despair, peace is possible. I experienced it firsthand through the President's personal engagement in diplomacy during the Gaza conflicts in 2012 and again this past summer, and his commitment to stop the onslaught of rockets and the terror tunnel attacks targeting Israelis. You've seen this commitment up close every time Secretary Kerry visits the region 
drawn by his strong desire to help Israelis and Palestinians resolve their conflict. Our leadership role was on full display last month when Secretary Kerry made an urgent visit to Amman to meet with Jordanian, Israeli, and political leaders, and Palestinian leaders, including a trilateral meeting with King Abdullah and Prime Minister Netanyahu to work toward restoring calm and de-escalating tensions in Jerusalem. Echoing the messages we've heard from Secretary Kerry in the White House, I want to restate the United States' firm belief in the importance of maintaining the status quo at the city's holy sites. During those recent tense weeks, my government has remained in close contact with all parties and we're exploring a range of ways in which we can support further de-escalation in Jerusalem and beyond. Stability and calm are imperative. It's also worth restating the core principle that violence and terrorism are completely unacceptable. The United States has repeatedly and loudly condemned recent terrorist attacks, including the horrific attacks at the light rail stations in which innocents were murdered, at the abhorrent attempt to kill Yehuda Glick, a spate of recent stabbings, and the brutal murders in the synagogue in Harnorf, on Harnof. There is never a justification for murder and terror. But in thinking about the value of continuing to pursue an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, consider for a moment how much more difficult it would have been to unwind what has transpired in recent weeks without the safety net of long-standing Arab-Israeli peace agreements, the peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, however incomplete and imperfect uh, that net is. It is in our interest to try to expand that circle. The resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of course, will only come about through direct negotiations. Unilateral actions, whether Palestinian initiatives at the United Nations or Israeli settlement construction and announcements, are counterproductive and only delay a resolution. And while we are realistic that negotiations will not likely resume during an Israeli election campaign, we also continue to explore the most effective way to reestablish a political horizon, without which we believe the current atmosphere could quickly deteriorate. But the main reason we remain committed to achieving a two-state solution is not because we believe it will solve all the problems of the Middle East. It won't. Rather, it's because we see no alternative that would achieve Israelis and Palestinians' legitimate goals and that would protect our own interests. Simply put, as Secretary Kerry said on Sunday, there is no one-state alternative. There is no other solution that is viable or that would preserve Israel's status as a Jewish state and a democracy. And for all the understandable doubts harbored by Israelis and Palestinians, there is no alternative, and we believe it can be done. So we are committed to keeping that hope alive. The Israelis follow American politics closely, whether during midterm or presidential elections. And since our midterms last month, a lot of ink has been spilled about what the results mean for the next two years. Here's a caution lest anyone jump to conclusions. Divided government in the United States, in which one party controls the Congress and the other the executive branch, does not necessarily mean foreign policy gridlock. What is unmistakable about our foreign policy system is that the Constitution provides the President with the largest share of power. Congress plays a critical role, but history shows that whether faced with domestic political gridlock or not, Presidents often surge and engage even more intensively in national security affairs in their final years in office. President Reagan delved deeper and deeper into arms control negotiations and agreements with the Soviet Union. He increased the U.S. force posture in the Persian Gulf and in his very last days in office initiated a dialogue with the PLO. President George H.W. Bush launched a major humanitarian intervention in Somalia just before leaving office. President Clinton led a NATO military intervention in Kosovo. He repeatedly confronted Iraqi aggression, engaged intensively in Arab-Israeli peacemaking up until his final days in office, and tried to mount a rapprochement with North Korea. President George W. Bush launched the surge in Iraq and then the Annapolis peace negotiations. Today, there's no shortage of crisis, crises and threats, and our agenda is very full. But there's also no doubt in my mind that President Obama will remain deeply and personally engaged in national security affairs through these remaining two years, advancing our interests in every region, using the full range of tools at our disposal, including consultations, those that involve consultations with Congress and those where he can act on his own authority. So I've tried to outline today a framework for enduring U.S. global leadership, uh, but in many ways, I've only scratched the surface. Consider for a moment that our military remains forward deployed in many parts of the world, extraordinarily capable, 
and more powerful than its next in line competitors by several orders of magnitude. Our energy security position has never looked stronger. Our higher education system continues to draw the best and brightest from every corner of the globe. Our economic recovery is expanding rapidly. Each of these could be the subject of its own speech. In short, American strength and resilience is alive, are alive and well. Just try to imagine what the Middle East and the world at large would look like today without American leadership. Imagine what your neighborhood would look like without the long-standing American commitment to enhance the possibilities for peace and security, without the campaign to stop Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons, without the partnerships we've established and nurtured with the moderate regimes of the region, without the campaign we are leading against Daesh and other violent extremists, without our constant defense of Israel's security and legitimacy, and without the ongoing quest for a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace. That's not a world any of us would want to live in, and with continued American leadership, we will not have to. So let me pause here. I know Ephraim wants to join me and uh, use the remaining time for some questions and dialogue. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be speak at the conference.